Church, say amen. 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 God, we bid you say amen one more time. Amen. We are just truly grateful and glad to be back in the Lord's house, even if it is an abbreviated version. I want to thank the brothers who were willing to come out with me today to just have some form of normalcy of getting back into the Lord's house. We will be wise, we will be cautious in our movement, and we will pay attention to the leaders and the scientists and the doctors as to detailing when we will come together as a family in this building. But we know wherever we are, God is with us in the midst. Amen. And wherever God is, there is truly a blessing in the house. Judges chapter 3 and verse 31 will be our lesson text for this morning. I'm just appreciative of uh, Brother Ivan, and Brother Lamar, and Brother Lacey, and Brother Shannon Sr., and Brother Ty for coming with me. I, I grew a little tired of preaching from a seat, and I want to get behind this great desk uh, to serve and love the Lord. And without further ado, the text of Scripture says, And after him was Shandar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox bow, and he also delivered Israel. For a subject this morning, when the odds seem to be against you, when the odds seem to be against you. Let's pray together. Oh Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, you are Lord. We, we thank you Lord for your grace and your mercy upon us that we are able to still be able to be among the living to hear our, hear our name called have power in our limbs have movement eyesight, being able to love upon our family and friends. Lord, we're just so grateful for the great blessing that you have given us. Lord, we pray in this hour for those who have lost their lives in this trying times. Lord, we pray for comfort. We ask you to be, oh Lord, with their family. Guide them, comfort them. Use our hands and our hearts and our minds, oh Lord, to to show them love, to be that leading shoulder, that, that gentle hug, that compassionate form of love. And Lord, we just pray for our first responders and our doctors and nurses and all those deemed essential workers, Lord. We, we ask you to bless them and strengthen them and protect them. We ask you, Lord, to be with our families as we navigate and make our way through this trying time. But we know, oh Lord, it is you who are guiding our footsteps. It is you who are blessing us along our way. So today we come before you, oh Lord, just to praise your name, to give you the thanks, just to humbly thank you for the meal that has been coming across our table. Thank you for the breath that we have in our body. Thank you, oh Lord, for the ability to work from home. And thank you, Lord, for just your grace upon our lives. Lord, we're just thankful the way able to come and, and, and be in your worship house this morning in this format. And we look forward to the day that we are able to assemble once again as one family. But we thank you for wisdom. We thank you for knowledge. We thank you for our understanding. And that our trust be in you and not in mankind. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. amen. As we battle this shelter in place, the fatigue of being sheltered in place may it sometimes cause us to, to have anxious moments. The reopening to potential mayhem in our country is still something that is still on many of our minds. In this unprecedented, unimaginable moment of death toll, this unprecedented moment where anxiety from foolishness of others, God is still good. Many are dealing with the uncertainty of tomorrow, not knowing whether or not they'll be able to pay their rent or being able to put food on the table 
but one thing is for sure, God is still good. Someone at this moment is dealing with the anguish of getting their test result from COVID-19. Not understanding whether it will be positive or negative, but they are hoping that there will be a brighter day tomorrow. But still, God is good. Someone at this moment is battling the despair of having a past due balance of their rent that grows every month, but not having enough money to meet that bill. But the despair is growing. But there's one thing still sure, God is good. Someone at this hour is finding the hurt of losing a loved one, not being able to be close to their family and give them their farewells, their goodbyes. And that hurt is lingering in their heart. That pain is working on their system. Their psyche has been broken. Their fear has overtaken them. But in the middle of all that, God is still good. Someone at this hour is fighting the, the idea of committing suicide or fighting off a domestic abusing spouse and they're running for safety, they're running for freedom, they're looking for help. But in the middle of all that, God hmm, is still good. Somebody here today ought to be glad that you are not looking like the natural man. The natural man sees this situation as hopeless. They see that there is no potential and then they give up because the coronavirus looks too big. The natural man looks at his position and seems like it's being overrun. The death toll number rises. The virus number of infection rises. Unemployment rises. Pain rises. Hostility rises. Crime rises. But at the end of the day, the natural man sees that the odds are against him. The natural man looks at the odds and sees that the overcoming appears to be bleak. It doesn't look good. Our horizon is too far away. Our help is too far yonder. And when you look at the natural man, he is encased in fear and can't move. He's been paralyzed by pain. But still, God is good. The natural man is he's looking at the odds and he goes, my survival is um, in it's, it's hampered because all around me there's pain, all around me there's sorrow. An uninvited intruder has appeared in my household. It's an invisible intruder. It's come in. It didn't ask, could it come in? But it kicked in my door. And here, anguish lays in my bedroom. Hopelessness sits at my dinner table. And fear is beating up everybody in my basement. But I come here to tell you today that God. Is still good. Somebody on the line, the child of God, the one who sees God, the one who walks with God, the one who talks with God, the one who believes in God, the one who has joy in the Lord, the one who has peace in the Lord, can look at the odds and go, I am still on top because as long as God is with me, that's all that I need. Somewhere within you, the warrior of God. In the scene where it seems like the odds are against you, it might just be you. But brother and sister, you are not by yourself. You are with the Lord. Let the warrior in you loose. Come on, God. Sham God. This man. The text tells us nothing about Sham God. When you come to find Sham God, all you find are two instances where Deborah talks about one in a song and then Judges 3.31. There is no back history behind Sham God. There is no family lineage of Sham God. But what is done is Sham God rises as a warrior who plays a great role in Israel's survival. When you look at Judges 3.31, Israel has fallen into a vicious cycle of disobedience to God. Yeah. They invoke the divine law that still holds true today. Galatians 6 7 says, What sort of man saw of that shall he also reap? When Israel bucked against God, it had God move out of the way and allow what was coming to them, as some folk would say, their come up in. Uh -huh. At times, many of us. Oh, just like ancient Israel. Yeah, yeah. 
We think we know more than God. We do things because we think we have a great knowledge, but then we don't really know a thing. God, who is awesome in his omnipotence, awesome in his knowledge, awesome in his presence, will let you do you who. He will let you find yourself. He will move out the way the moment you think you're greater than God. You see, I remember there was a preacher's parable about a scientist who said that he could do anything God could do. So God entertained him in his foolishness. God said, meet me on the hill over yonder Tuesday at 12 o'clock. So God met the scientist. And he said, God, I can do anything you can do. God said, well, let's make man. God swooped down and took some dirt, shake it into a body, and then breathe into his nostrils, and that dirt became a living being. So the scientists went to gather his own dirt. And then God said, no, no, make your own dirt. The idea behind that is, you and I can't do a thing without God. You and I can't move water without God. You and I can't raise a family without God. You and I can't establish ourselves on this earth without God. You and I can't develop our own righteousness without God. You and I can't justify ourselves without God. You and I can't sanctify ourselves without God. You and I can't redeem ourselves without God. You and I can't save ourselves without God. For without God, we are nothing. But here's Israel. In the futility of their mind, they thought they could do anything else without God. Israel failed to remain faithful and went chasing Baal. Israel failed to keep their covenant with the Lord. If you're a historian, you will realize back in Joshua 24, they even reaffirmed their covenant with the Lord. But even then, not long after that, they failed to keep their end of the covenant. Israel remained humble after witnessing God's power but then lost their humbleness as their head began to grow. You see, sometimes we in life experience great blessings and then get consumed by the blessing and forget about the one who provided the blessing. You see, Israel lost its mind like some of us at times have lost our mind. You see, when God lets you do you, three things happen. Your physical and spiritual sustainment gets interrupted. In other words, you and I cannot properly provide for us physically nor spiritually unless God is our helper. Number two, you will experience a power reduction. When you let go of God, you lose your ability to overcome obstacles like your invisible enemy because now God has been put out of your life by your own truth. Sir, there is a loss of providential protection and vision becomes limited. What do you mean, Brother Bradley? When you decide to live life without God, God allows you to walk down the road you choose that you can't see what God can see. You can't learn what God knows, but you need God to direct your every footstep. That's why Jeremiah said, it is not within man to direct his own steps. But I want to give you some evidence. I want to give you some evidence today that Israel lost their mind. Judges chapter 2 and verse 1 and 3. The Bible says, Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Boshan. And he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore I also say, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their God will be a snare to you. In other words, God is telling Israel, since you chose to go to false gods and not keep your end of the covenant with me, I will allow what's coming to you to come. 
come to you. He will no longer be a protection. He will no longer be a provider of help. He will no longer be a sustainer while you choose to reject him. Then in verse 11 of Judges chapter 2, the Bible says, Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook their God, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and asked off. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he gave them into the hands of the plunderers who plundered him. And he sold them to the hands of the enemies and around them. So that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord has spoken and as the Lord had sworn it to them, so that they were severely distressed. When you walk without God, your life will severely be distressed. You will go through heartache. You will go through turmoil. You will go through problems that you on your own can't fix. But when there's a helper on the way, when God is your helper, you can overcome any odds that are in front of you. God did not want to let that remnant that believed in him to be overrun and overtaken by the enemy. And God, through our judges, utilized powerful people to accomplish his task of saving his people. And one of those people was this great man called Shamgar. The name Shamgar, the son of Anak, is not your Hebrew name. It is not an ordinary Hebrew name. Many scholars will contend or say he is also a Canaanite who's living in the land that God used to bless somebody. It is this man, Shemgar, that we can learn that God will work through many people in many ways. God will bless his people through many ways and many people and he will use it to protect those who keep their trust in God. I know, I know right now you may not trust all the officials. You, you may not trust all the doctors. You, you may not trust all the technicians. You may not trust all the scientists. But I ask you this morning, I beseech of you this morning, I beg of you this morning to put your trust in the Lord. Listen at what God was already telling Israel. It was me that brought you out of captivity. It was me that delivered you from the hand of your enemy. It was me that sustained you while you walked through the wilderness. When you complained about bread, I gave you quail. It was the Lord that brought us through. It's God that's bringing us through this pandemic. It's the Lord that's putting food on our table. It's the Lord that's allowing us to still help us pay our bills. It's the Lord that is helping us to stay protected from this coronavirus. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's the Lord's doing. And somebody this morning just ought to give God a little bit of thanks for him blessing us to this point. Amen. Some of us are missing our share of our moment. You see, every Christian, every believer will have a crossroad moment. And what you do when you come to this crossroad will detail and display the depth and level of your faith. You see, your sharing God moment right now might be in the face of all this adversity is to rise up and fight against an invisible enemy. I'm not talking about just coronavirus. I'm talking about the devil operating in this world. Our families are being lost through all different types of vices. Pornography, drinking, illicit sexual situations. You've got folk who are adapt or adapting to being a baby mama more than a wife. You've got men who are happy just to have children without a wife. You've got families being broken because somebody still want to party when they got obligations at home. You've got houses being torn up. Because somebody decides they don't want to be a parent no more. They still want to be single life. They still want to be in that Beyonce life. They want the ring but don't want the responsibility. Oh, come on with me this morning. Somewhere along the line, we have lost our way. We have lost our vision. 
We have lost our purpose. And God right now needs a believer to have a share of God moment. Amen. Instead of fighting for our faith. Too many Christians are fighting for economical gain for earthly good. Instead of fighting for our faith to grow in our lives. Many are focused on practicing building a selfish heart. Instead of leading the way in righteousness, many are missing their share of God moment, chasing dead earthly relationships and committing spiritual suicide. Instead of being a light to those in darkness, many are missing their share of God moment by investing time in activities that put a lampshade on their land. Instead of being the salt that brings flavor to the sick world, missing their sham guard moment, many are falling prey to the seductive nature of a sinful lifestyle. Sham guard is only mentioned twice in the scripture, but sham guard changed the picture for Israel. Right. Someone today needs to have a sham guard moment. God is looking for you to rise up to make a difference. You may feel insignificant at times, but God says you are extremely valuable. You see, share God's not mentioned as much as Abraham. And some might know who is share God. But some of us may look and say he's an ex in insignificant role in the march to Jesus. But I contend to you today that share God not rose the bridge, rise up. We might not have had King David come along. Oh, come on, line with me, somebody. Somebody had to rise to keep the lineage moving so that our king could come rise and fight for us a battle that you and I could not win. Yeah. Thank God for Shamgar. Yeah, yeah. When you look at Shamgar, he is just a simple farmer. And sometimes some of us look at ourselves and we think, we aren't all that. We, 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 we think too lowly of ourselves, but I come here to tell you, never think too low of yourself. You're so valuable to God that God said, I will not leave you destitute and lonely. You are so valuable to God that God himself had a conversation between God, God, and God. And the text says, who shall go for us? Somebody told me that the word came for us. The word, the Logos of God, came and put on flesh, put on skin, put on mankind, and walked with us, talked with us, ate with us, cried with us, was joyful with us, died like us, got up so we could get up with him one great day in the morning. I got a God that not only looks sits high, but he comes low and connects with me through understanding exactly what I'm going through. You're never too insignificant in the kingdom of God. Everybody has great value in the kingdom. This farmer, this farmer, he plowed the land, tirelessly moving dirt and mud. You see, farming is a difficult time. It's a difficult task. Even now with tractors and all these different types of gadgets, the farmer still works hard. But come back to Sam God's day. He's driving an oxen. Possibly two oxen lined up in front of each other. And he's driving these oxen. And he's tearing up or he's cultivating the land. And in front of him, at some point in his lifetime, he has to deal with 600 Philistine enemies. He's got to deal with warriors. Warriors who are trained in the execution of humans. Warriors that specialize in utilizing weapons. Warriors whose intent and purpose is to destroy. But here is this lonely farmer driving his oxen with just an ox goal. The farmer, instead of fleeing from adversity, stood strong against the enemy. The odds were 600 to 1. But I believe when God is on your side, you've got more than enough. Paul later said, if God be for us, who can be against us? This farmer took the resources that he had and fought with what he had. Come on, somebody. You see, sometimes you think you aren't prepared to fight the battle that's ahead of you. But God is telling you, I won't let nothing come towards you that you can't already have. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 
13. In other words, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, you are equipped enough to put up a fight. You've got enough to say, I'm a warrior for the Lord. You've got enough to get up and take what you have and fight against your enemy. If all you have is just one scripture, if all you can remember is just one scripture, then remember the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I won't want for victory because my shepherd will deliver me. I won't want for deliverance because my shepherd will deliver me. I won't want for mercy because my shepherd will bring mercy. I won't want or need for grace because my shepherd will give me grace. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He had the right attitude. He had the attitude to fight for his survival. And too many of us Christians right now are laying down in our faith. Mm. We're giving in to the temptation of the world. We keep chasing the diamond instead of chasing Christ. We keep chasing the car instead of chasing Christ. We keep chasing retirement instead of chasing Christ. Israel chased everything else instead of chasing God. And God simply moved out the way and let them have what they wanted and they wound up in captivity. What holds you hostage today? As a child of God who have been free from hostage, what's holding you hostage right now? Does fear still hold you hostage? Does pain still hold you hostage? Does the pressure of life still hold you hostage? Why does it hold you hostage? Have you really stepped up to the fight? Mm -hmm. He had the right mindset. The courage to stand his ground. You see, some of the things, the brothers and I, when we were talking yesterday, led by the class by Brother Johnson, we were talking about the ways of this world and how things have gotten out of hand. Some of these things socially have gotten out of hand because too many Christians have remained quiet in their faith. We have socially accepted things because we didn't want to say no. But somebody ought to got up and say yes for Jesus. Sometimes you might have felt it was just you and the voice crying in the wilderness. But I'm glad there was a voice crying in the wilderness. That voice came in one time and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah, yeah. John, that great revelation. We are so glad that God is blessing us. When we look at Shem God, he had the right vision to see the opportunity in front of him, not as a burden, but as a potential blessing. You see, when you see COVID-19, do you see a burden or do you see a blessing? When you see the trouble in this world, do you see a burden or do you see a blessing? Because how you see things will determine whether or not you will rise up as a warrior for the Lord. Somebody's got to be tired of our families being torn apart. Somebody's got to be tired of folk wiring and committing crime because they just don't know better. Somebody's got to be tired of folk being lost to false doctrine. Somebody's got to be tired of their family members giving in to the lust of the flesh and the pride of the eye and the lust of life. Somebody's got to be tired. And if you're tired, baby, instead of sitting down, get up for the Lord. Use what you got like Shem God. His eyes, his eyes saw 600 fighters, but his face said, we can win. His eyes saw 600 men with weapons, but his face said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. His eyes saw 600 warriors coming his way, but his face said, victory is mine. Mm -hmm. What is it that your eyes see that is hindering your faith from growing? What is it that your eyes see that blocks you from your victory? What is it that your eyes see that hinders your spiritual development? The odds didn't intimidate Shem God because his faith was strong. The odds didn't discourage him because faith accesses God's power to bring the delivery. The odds didn't deter him because standing up meant his faith would bring about Victory. The question is now, are you going to rise like Shem God? Mm -hmm. Will you sit in your faith? Or will you rise and take on the invisible army in front of you? Mm -hmm. 
Brother Bradley, how do I do it? Brother Bradley, how do I do it? How do I get there, Brother Bradley? I, I, I'm sitting here. Because you remember Shamgar. Mm. Shamgar's a farmer. And as a farmer, every now and then he's got to deal with mud caked on his flat. Mm. And he would take his oxen go and he would clean off the plow so that he could still have forward movement. And every now and then, when the oxen wouldn't move, he would flip around the ox boot. Because on the tip of it was like a stick. And he would pry that oxen to keep moving forward. Oh, stay close with me right now. Don't hang up on me side of space. Don't, don't disconnect. Don't travel to the next worship just yet. Hold on just a little bit. You, you gotta have a sham guard moving. Because he was what Sham God had to do was he had to utilize the resources he had in order not to be stuck in the mud. Some of us are stuck where we are because we don't use the resources God has given us. Amen. Our relationships aren't blossoming because we keep using outside resources instead of using the wisdom and knowledge of God. We're in go nowhere jobs and we let that get us. But how do you know God hasn't planted you there just to bring somebody to Christ? You complaining about my job, but your job pays your bills. Your, your job helps you to get offered. Your job keeps the roof over your head. But most importantly, your job was given to you by God. You ought to rejoice that you've got a God that will sustain you not only physically, but spiritually. Because if your spirit has been renewed, Isaiah 40 and verse 31, you will see it more as a blessing than a burden. Come on, Some of us are stuck in the mud spiritually. Because we are complacent in our faith. We think we know enough and don't know nothing. We'll sit there and say, I got peace in my heart. But we'll turn around and fight with everybody at job. You can't have the peace of the Lord in your heart if your heart is combative. If your heart is hostile. If your heart harbors anger. If your heart is wrathful. Because those things are not to be part of you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. The Bible says that all bitterness, wrath, anger, and malice be put away from you. If you are stuck in the mud, those are the type of things that will grow in your spirit. Okay. You're not designed to be sedentary. You are designed to be progressive. To be moving forward in your faith. 2 Peter 3.18 The Bible says, but grow in the grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The reason why some of our circumstances and problems are getting the best of us because we've got a stuck in the mud faith. Well, mm -hmm. Shamgar mm. didn't have a stuck in the mud faith. Shamgar took what he had and rose to the occasion yeah. and fought like a warrior. Yeah. How, do I, how do I rise, Brother Bradley? You got to let God equip you for battle. When Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 says, put on the whole armor of God, you can't put on just the helmet. You can't just pick up the shield. You've got to put everything on. Because if you don't, you will be ill-prepared for battle. Somebody might look at Shamgar. Mm, come on, somebody. And might say, he wasn't prepared. He wasn't a warrior. He didn't have swords and, and, and knives and bowls and arrows. But see, what Samgar had was his faith and his resources. If God is your resource, mm. that's all you need to fight your battle. All you got to do is stand. Yeah. God laid at one time for Israel. All you got to do is show up to the battle. Yeah. I will fight for you. Yeah. All you got to do is come to the valley. I'll meet your enemy in the valley. All you got to do is get up and I'll fight for you. All you got to do is come to the brink and I will fight for you. You got to have a faith that says when God says put this on, that's what I'm going to do. I may not use it all because God is my protector, but at least I need to be battle ready. Come on, God. You see, what Shandor had was a damage side moment. If you remember the karate kid, and he had him waxing his car mm -hmm. and cleaning the windows. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, come on. And so Dan, Daniel was wondering, how could this be out of me? How could this prepare me for war? How could this prepare me for combat? But see, Shamgar didn't have questions like Daniel did. Because 
See, what Daddy was doing was learning how to defend himself when the attacker was coming. Oh, stay with me on the line. When oh, Shadrach was pushing the mud off the fire, he was developing the muscles that are needed to drive off the potential coming enemy. Oh, come on, somebody. When you use God's word, it's going to be what you need to drive off your enemy. But you got to prepare before your enemy comes. Because once your enemy comes, it's too late to get ready. When Shamgar was climbing the oxen, he was already learning what it's like to get rid of something in front of him. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody's got to see God's word. We'll prepare you to get rid of things that are in front of you. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 5. Paul says, therefore, mortify these deeds which are among your body. Get rid of this. Get rid of that. And when you get rid of this and you get rid of that, God will supply all that you need. Secondly, you got to see more than victory for yourself. Sadly, we have too many Christians who are selfish. And selfishness is a blocking blesser and killer. Paul warned us in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, ununited in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, don't just think about you. Think about your brother or sister in Christ. You see, sometimes I get it. We get a little tired along the way. Sometimes we don't want to sing praises because we have grown a little weary. Sometimes we don't want to read our scripture. Or sometimes we just want to lay back and just chill. We can't be like God and let's chill. We got to let the chilling go. We got to let God in our heart. And we got to see it's more to my life than just me. Yeah, yeah. Share God. Was concerned about his family. And history shows his actions helped save Israel. He thought about more than just him. The question is, who else do you think about? Mm. Who else in your day-to-day -day life do you think about? Is it all about you? Mm. But when I look at my God, my God said, it's about us. If I had time and could move from behind this pulpit, mm. I'd walk around this building and I would show us how God thought about us before we got here. Brother Ty sometimes said, if God had made us first, mm -hmm. we would have got the big head yes, and said, look what we did. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the days of creation, I look at God that made a sun that still shines, mm -hmm. perfectly placed away from the earth so I don't melt and I don't freeze. I've got a God that looked into the ocean and put a few fishes so I could eat. I've got a God that thought about me so much. Put a couple trees on the ground. Not only so that they could clean the air, 
is God saying, I'm thinking about you first. The question is, who are you thinking about? Third, as I got to land this plane, you got to fight to win instead of fleeing to fail. You got to fight to win instead of fleeing to fail. You see, so often, we get in a predicament and a problem and we run from our faith. We go practice things the world does thinking we can overcome. But if you fight with your faith, you will see God will always make you the victor. You will see that God will always bring you through. You see, you need a shadow of faith. He looked beyond the odds and let his faith take him to victory. Mm -hmm. Lastly, you got to be committed. Mm -hmm. Sadly, what we have now are Christians who are committed only based off circumstantial situation. Mm -hmm. If God is good to me, then I'll show up to worship. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Come on, if God bless my table, then I'll be there to praise. Teach, but when things go tough, I abandon God. Yes, if you watch it, I'm talking to you. You can't abandon the God that loved you so much in the middle of adversity. Adversity is what helps to reveal the level and depth of our faith. If you don't go through something, you will remain stuck in the moment. You've got to fight and be committed to it. Just as your Savior was committed to saving us. Think about the process that he went through. The Hebrew writer said, for the job that was set before him, he endured the cross. Yeah, yeah. What did he endure, Brother Black? Oh, he endured going into the synagogue and reading from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 and say this day, has this scripture been fulfilled in your ears? And then later, have a disciple go. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Mm -hmm. His own hometown mm -hmm. ran him out of town. Mm -hmm. If he wanted, he could have just stopped right there. But he went in here. He went and told a man on the Sabbath, take up your mat and walk. And instead of being joyful that a man was here, folk got indignant and got mad because he did it on the Sabbath. Well, what's more important? Somebody being healed or maintaining the Sabbath for ritual sake? Mm -hmm. well, come on, somebody. See, when you hang on for ritual sake, because it's a ritual, you have lost sight of your heart. If God doesn't have your heart, you're more mechanical than faith. Mm, oh, stand in line with me right now. Jesus said in John 5, 39, he said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have life. But they are they that testify of me. And later he went and told them, you should have loved me because of who I am and who I am. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was committed to the salvation of our soul. Are you committed to not only the salvation of your soul, but the saving of another? Brothers and sisters, if you are that person today, or going through your Shamgar moment, and all you've done is sit there, today is your day to rise up against the odds. I know it doesn't look good with your natural eye, but your spiritual eye can say, my God is great. Your spiritual eyes should say right now that if God doesn't bring me through this, there's better waiting for me over yonder. Can't you hear me? John 14 and verse 1. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. He says, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. The idea is if things just don't work out in our favor here on earth, we got a better place over yonder. God will bless you in one way or another. Mm -hmm. You just got to maintain in your moment of faith 
that will have you rise like a warrior. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not a child of God today, I'm trying my best to help you to see it is best to walk with God than to walk by yourself. How can I walk with God, Brother Bradley? You've got to hear the gospel. Hear that Jesus died, that he was buried, that he rose again to die no more. you got to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And believing, you got to repent. Because you believe Jesus as king, you believe Jesus is Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 13. He said in Luke 3, uh, 13, 3 and 5, he says, Nay, set your repentance. You saw like wise parents. That's what the king said. That's what our leader said. That's what the one who loves us said. If you love them, do what he tells you. But well, what did he tell us to do? Repent. Which simply means to turn away from. It. To turn away from and never to turn back to again. Turn away from the practices of sin and turn toward the wisdom and knowledge of God. Let the Lord lead you. Confess faith in him. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Because unless you make him known on earth, he can't make you known in heaven. So you've got to declare, just like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then from there, we'll baptize you. As you can see, we're already at the church building. We're waiting on you. The baptism clothes is ready. The baptizer is ready. The water is ready. But the question is, are you ready? Are you going to stay stuck in the mud of all your problems, or will you get up and fight for the salvation of your soul and come to Christ? If you come to Christ, the Lord will bless you every step. Doesn't mean he'll make all your problems go away. But the one thing is, he will be there with you as you deal with those problems. As you go through the consequences of life, God will help you and guide your every footstep. He will be your protector. He will be your provider. But the thing is, you've got to come. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor in the heavy laden, I will give you rest. Your inner man will not have rest until you come to Christ. If you come to Christ today, we're at 3100 13th Street, Northwest, here at the church building, waiting on you. If you stand in need of prayer, please put your prayer in the comments, and we would gladly offer our prayer for you today. It is our hope and prayer that this message blessed you, this message was able to save you, and but most importantly, this message was able to help focus you on being a warrior for God that God expects of us. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God. How lesson is thy name in all the earth. Lord, we come before you today, praying for the strength to be warriors for our faith. Lord, help us to rise and share your word. Lord, help us to rise and be a light to this world. Lord, help us to rise and be a salt to this earth. Lord, help us to rise that our faith will become contagious. Lord, help us to rise so that we can touch the hearts of those who've been wounded by this world. Lord, help us to be your children, that we're able to share your gospel, to teach and, 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 and preach your word so that men and women will obey before it is everlasting to me. Lord, we thank you for blessing the church. We thank you for blessing the church worldwide that we're able to still be standing during the coronavirus. Lord, we thank you for all the members here at 13th Street who still gather to come together to praise your name and, and to give you thanks and to beg and beseech of you, Lord, to help us in our moments. Lord, when we come before you today just thanking you. We thank you for our victories. We thank you for helping us to overcome. We thank you for sustaining us throughout this pandemic. Lord, we pray for the souls who, who have asked for prayer, Lord, those who are going through things, those who are dealing with various temptations and struggles and trials. Lord, we pray for our sick and shut and those who are not doing well physically. Lord, we pray for your help upon them. We pray for uh, Brother Heath, Julius, and Jeff Heath, we pray for Sister Heath, those who are undergoing uh, situations, Lord. We pray for all our members who, who may be mentally fatigued, Lord, from this coronavirus. And we just pray that your word will inspire them and encourage them to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Lord, help us to have a heart to reach out and love upon one another and encourage one another. And Lord, we look forward to that day where we're able to come together as family in one house. Lord, we pray that we're able to do things wisely. We ask you to give us knowledge and understanding so that we can move properly. We pray, Lord, for our president and our government leaders. We ask you, Lord, to bless them with wisdom. We ask you to bless the doctors and, and nurses and technicians and scientists who are seeking for a cure or for medicine. But we know, oh Lord, the greatest cure, the greatest medicine we can have is to be in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we pray that we can share your word constantly, openly, and courageously. It is through your son's name that we offer this prayer and we give these thanks. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Amen.